Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bordeaux Show. Uh, once again, this is our biweekly series. We're on episode seven, covering the six families of the Bordeaux wines, part three. I'm Ron Edwards, Master Sommelier and Director of Wine Education for Winebow. So let me introduce your host, certified Bordeaux educator, TJ Griffin. TJ has held many jobs within the wine industry from hospitality to wholesale. Throughout his career, what he enjoyed most was learning about wine and sharing that knowledge with others. As the corporate wine educator for Winebow, he now enjoys the privilege of doing what he loves full time. And now here to discuss today's topic, the families of Bordeaux, part trois, I suppose, uh, TJ Griffin. Hey Ron, yes it is indeed, part trois. It's, that's rough to say because you have to change your R's uh, mid-sentence there. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so we're, we're chugging along through the six families of Bordeaux wines, and today we're going to uh, look at something called the Libronne. Um, so this is a term that uh, is not exactly synonymous with the right bank, although that's kind of the area we're covering. But when I think what a lot of people um, say the right bank, they specifically mean saint Emilion and Pomerol, which is definitely part of the Libronne, but there's more to it than just that. Um, and it's, it's an area that I'm pretty familiar with. So I just want to share this quick story. Uh, when I was over there for getting my, my accreditation as a certified Bordeaux teacher, they had a rally through the vineyards in saint Emilion, And they had these old Citroën cars that are, are obviously manual shift. The uh, shift is on the dashboard. They're very, very old. And... Uh, so I signed up for it. I don't drive stick shift run. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's already starting to make me laugh. <laughs> you know, I, I always say I've, I've held every every position in a restaurant that you can hold except for valet because I can't drive a stick. Mm -hmm. um, but I said, no worries, because they were they were putting us in teams. Um, so I found out that morning one of my team uh, decided not to. He decided to go home early, a day early. So he wasn't there. I'm like, oh, well, I'll have the other guy drive. The other guy shows up uh, with a, his leg on a, a cart. He had broken his foot, his right foot, which is kind of important if you're going to drive stick. So he and I uh, drove jerkily throughout St. Emilion all day. It was um, comical to watch. And, and I, I ended up getting a speeding ticket. So speeding. I know the area well. While driving jerkily. <laughs> Yeah, I can just imagine it. I still remember learning how to drive stick, and it jerking is the uh, the operative word for sure. Once I was going, I was great, but uh, it was the stopping and starting and backing up, and it was, it was a mess. Um, and I was going over, I think the speed limit, I, I went over the speed limit by three miles per hour, and it was a 95 euro ticket. So don't do that. Lots of cameras in France. So uh, quick... Quick etymology of uh, Libourne, it's named after the town of Libourne, which was founded by Roger de Leyburn, who was an English, I learned this word today, Ron, Seneschal. He was a Seneschal, which is basically at that time, uh, sort of the sheriff of the area. You, you sort of ruled the area, made sure everything was running smoothly. And this was his area for the King of England. This was under English control at the time. Um, ah, so it was the Seneschal of Nottingham, but <laughs> yes, the Seneschal of uh, I guess it was, well, I think it was Gas Gascogne, Gascony. I think he was uh, typically, but this town he founded as a Bastide, another word I learned, which is a medieval fortified town, uh, and that's where we get the name Libourne. So, uh, a couple of important things to know: two big rivers, the Isle and the Barban. Uh, the Barban River is interesting because it was a linguistic boundary uh, for a long time. Below, south of the Barban River was the Langa Duk, the language of the, the Ok, and uh, north of that was the Langa Doi. So uh, Langa Duk, obviously we get Langa Duk from. Langa Doi, I have no idea what that means or where. Uh, I guess we'll have to ask Sonia. We'll have to ask yeah. Sonia later. She'll that know. That's a Sonia question. Sonia is our uh, director of organizational development who also happens to be 
fluent in French and uh, including a master's degree in, I think, medieval French or literature or something crazy like that. So she knows all that stuff. I bet she does know what a Langdoy is. Um, so this is, uh, this is from the Bordeaux website. You can see I actually blocked out some appellations because we covered them in the coat uh, that would uh, in our last episode uh, that would technically be part of Libourne. But you can see here we're, we're going to cover um, today, we're going to cover Saint Emilion, what's cut off there on the right is Saint Emilion Grand Cru, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, Pomerol, those are the two big appellations. And then uh, Saint Emilion has four satellite uh, appellations Lustac, Montagne, Saint Georges, and Puisigan. And Pomerol has one, La Lande de Pomerol. We are not going to cover Fronsac and Canon Fronsac today. And I'll tell you why later. It's very exciting. Um, so we're just going to cover the other regions today and talk about those. So brief history. So this is the sort of town center of Saint Emilion. Uh, and if you see the people up there, it's kind of hard to see, but their, their background would be the steeple. You see people up there in the wall looking down. Um, I'm not in this photo, but I was up in that wall, which is very cool. This is a really, really cool town. It's obviously, it's a, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as are the surrounding vineyards, so it's a very historic area. Um, so this goes back to, uh, viticulture here goes back to Roman times. Uh, Decimius Magnus Osonius was a Roman poet, and that's where we get uh, Chateau Oson today, um, is supposedly where he lived, his villa. Um, uh, Saint Emilio itself is named after Emilianus, and he uh, was the religious leader in this community, he died in 787. And around the area, his, his room where he died, they dug out this church. So this church, as you see in the bottom, is actually dug into rock. And they were, I saw some people, uh, when I was up in that wall, I saw some people going in and out. So I said, oh, it must be open. I ran down the steep, uh, if it would be to the left, uh, on this picture, the steep, steep road, ran down there just in time to see them lock it up again. So I did not get to go in, um, but very, very cool. Uh, 11th century, the town was formed. Uh, 13th century, Libourne, uh, Pomerol was along the um, pilgrimage route, the Santiago de Compostela in Spain. So you would, you would make this pilgrimage to there. And a lot of wine regions in both uh, France and Spain uh, are along that route, they popped up. Um, the Knights Hospitaller, who were returning uh, crusaders, they set up several hosp hostels in the region. Uh, so Pomerol was, was very, became a popular area for that. Um, they set up the Gazan Hospital, which um, today we have Chateau Gazan. And then the uh, trade started to, to go well, you know, England, then you had, uh, which we've mentioned before, the the Hundred Years' War, uh, which kind of ruined a lot of things for them. So really, the whole area was devastated for a while. In the 18th century, trade started to revive in wine. But at that time, it wasn't saint Emilion or Pomerol that got all the press. It was Fronsac. Fronsac was the most esteemed area at that time. Um, 19th century, we're not going to cover the classification of saint Emilion today because we're going to have a whole episode devoted to classifications. But... Everyone's familiar with the big 1855 classification on the left bank. Um, St. Emilio was not included, nor was Pomerol, because those wines wasn't a quality issue necessarily. It was uh, they weren't shipped overseas. It just wasn't as convenient uh, as the left bank. So the courtier decided not to classify them uh, because of that reason. So, but they, uh, St. Emilio eventually got its own classification. Um, up and in, well into the 19th century too, white wines were pretty popular in Pomerol. And apparently that was because of the Dutch influence. The Dutch found white wines very uh, saleable in Northern Europe. But um, I can't imagine white wines in Pomerol today. It was actually banned when it became an official AOC in 1936. But in 1884, saint Emilion became the first region in France to set up a syndicat viticole, uh, a really, you know, a, uh, a bureau to oversee and start rules and, and eventually, you know, became part of the AOC system. Uh, said World Heritage Site. And then anything more important to tell you about that? No, 
I mean, there's a lot more obviously history, but that, that'll do us for today. So Cinq de Million and its satellites. So originally there were six satellites, uh, called satellites of course, because they sort of uh, revolve around the bigger appellation of Cinq de Million, the more well-known. There are now four. So there's the beautiful town of Cinq de Million. Just picture me and my poor guest with his broken foot, just, just stop and start all the way around that circle. It was, uh, it was pretty ugly. So this is a quote that I found on Guild Somme uh, from Véronique Bourigo, who's a winemaker and educator for the L'Ecole du Vin de Saint-Emilion. And I think it's important because uh, it really sums up uh, a lot about Saint-Emilion wines. There is not one style of Saint-Emilion. The limestone plateau and the flat areas are completely different. It's not like Burgundy where one terroir is an appellation. We have many different terroir within an appellation. And that's, it's, it's a rather large area and uh, you can make some broad generalities about Saint Emilion, but uh, you really have to talk about where you are um, within it. You have the limestone plateau, which is uh, in theory where the best vineyards are planted. And then you have the slopes and then you have the more uh, gravelly uh, terrace. And then uh, Pomerol we'll cover in a minute, but um, very different. So. St. Emilio is often divided up into the coat, the slopes, or the grave, the gravel. And depending on where you are, is uh, can tell you a little bit about the style of the wine. But, um, you know, as we know from other talks, you really have to, you can't just go by the vineyard, you have to go by the chateau um, and who is working it. And uh, you can't make, I don't think it's fair to make quality assumptions just based on the terroir. No, so here we go. Not. Sorry, go ahead. You probably can't, but where you find like here uh, on that far right of the screen where it talks about the sandy gravelly plain, there's so far nobody's proven they can make like yeah. world-class longevity driven wines there. And it's important for the audience if they haven't looked into saint this is one of the more complex soil areas in French winemaking. Um, and we are sort of grossly dividing it into three or four majors and three majors of for high quality wine. But, you know, even in that, if you take a look at the geology soil, soil map or the soil geology map, even of the plateau or the coat, it's really interspersed. It's not as consistent as one might like to look. And um, so that's another reason that it becomes sort of very Bordeaux-like where it's about brand winemaker reputation, a stylistic impression, et cetera, um, combined with uh, what the underlying soil is. A little less focus on soil for sure than what you're going to find in Burgundy or even, you know, Piemonte or something like that, where it really, their focus is actually the piece of land and the producer comes second. Yeah. And uh, not to get too off topic on this, uh, but I used to go to the Union de Grand Cru um, uh, Saint Emilion tasting uh, that was put on every year. The producer would come over and taste their wines. I, I really like Saint Emilion quite a bit, um, but I noticed I noticed in the last few years a, a sort of um, sameness about the wines. And if you looked in the guidebook, it would tell you who the consulting winemaker is. And uh, consultants are huge in Saint Emilion. And really, I won't say any names, but it was really like three different people who did about 90% of the wines in the room. Um, and I started to think maybe that's a, maybe there is some sameness about these. They're all kind of doing the same thing. And I asked one of the organizers what they thought about that. Um, and they sort of smirked. I said, aren't they worried about all tasting the same? And, and he, he sort of smirked and said, I think they would probably say something about terroir. I'm like, yeah, probably. But um, you, you're not going to notice it if you're just tasting a wine individually, but when you have them side by side by side by side, all from the same vintage, it. Uh, I hope that that's a trend that sort of dies off, but we'll see. Um, so this is from the St. Emilio website. Another thing, Ron, that is sort of uh, comical and frustrating at the same time, as I'm finding out as my journey through Bordeaux here, is the availability of information. Some of these appellations have really good websites, like, I think this graphic is great. Um, some do not. 
and uh, you, I would hope that there would be more information about certain things, and I can't find it because they don't really promote it as well. So it's it's a it's a hit or miss as things go with the information. But yes, the limestone plateau in the center, that's where everybody wants to be, or on the slopes. Um, then you have the clay soils uh, and the sandy soils don't do as well for the Bordeaux grapes. Um, uh, but limestone, uh, Cabernet Franc really likes limestone a lot. Um, and Merlot, uh, it does really well in the clay. So, uh, but we're still talking about mostly Merlot as we, you know, it's the quintessential Bordeaux grape and it's the big grape here in saint Emilion. And Cabernet Sauvignon is allowed, um, certainly, but it's not a major player, except for, I believe, Chateau Fijac uh, features a bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. But other than that, it's really Merlot's the star with Cabernet Franc uh, playing best supporting role. So let's talk about the satellites. Um, Montagne Saint Emilion. Montagne, um, if for those of you who uh, speak French, uh, obviously it's mountain. So the mountain of Saint Emilion, uh, there's no mountain. It's uh, <laughs> there's some some hills uh, that you can go up. Uh, it's a rolling hill topography, but it's not a mountain exactly. And this is the largest satellite. Um, this goes back to the website, Ron. So there's a website for Saint Emilion and three of the four satellites, not Montagne. Montagne decided to go off on their own and have their own website, which is only in French and has no cool infographics, unfortunately. Well, you know, if your name is Montagne, you you have a grand idea of yourself and you should have your own <laughs> website. I think, well, you know, I think it's really interesting because if you think about contextually, right? If you take out the world traveling nature of the modern world and you think back to when these names were created, People grew up, were born, lived, and died in, within a 10-mile radius of, of everything they ever did, right? right? So that would be a mountain to them because they never seen the Alps. Or, you know, but still, it is just a kind of a sloping hillside. Uh, but, you know, it's my mountain. It's my mountain here in Centimillon. Well, I, I wonder if they were, they were actual mountain climbers back in that, you know, and then they, they, they advertised, you know, I'm a mountain climber. Oh, are you? Try climbing this. Um, so I put red wines only. I could have put that in every satellite. Um, it's, it's all red wines here. Um, and it's mostly Merlot. And they actually restrict some of the, um, uh, the grapes here. So whereas in general Bordeaux, you can plant all the grapes that we've talked about before. Here, um, they will actually restrict certain percentages of, you know, you can only do 10% of Carmenere, you can only do 10% of Petit Bordeaux uh, combined. Not in every satellite, but there's rules. So it's really limited to Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Malbec. Malbec is a little bit of a, a bigger player here than it is in the left bank. And here the, the main soils are clay limestone. Um, what else should I tell you about Montagne? Oh, so the, uh, originally there were two more satellites, Sable and Passac and they were um, discontinued. Um, the vineyards that were in Parsec uh, now qualify for Montagna, and uh, Sabo was just sort of disappeared. Um, but they were on the books until the 90s. Yes, they were, because I had to memorize those. That's how old. <laughs> Don't you hate that? All, that? all that studying, and now it's not even relevant anymore. But and you know, I will say, no one ever asked me a question about it. Ever. So, you know. But if you didn't study it. Yeah, they would, you know, it's like taking a raincoat on vacation so it won't yes. rain, right? <laughs> um, so, Lussac, Lussac Saint Emilion. Confusingly, a couple of different websites uh, had Lussac as the northernmost, and then somebody said Puisagan as the northernmost. So, I, I'm just going by the map. Uh, I'm going to go with Lusac as the northernmost because that's what it looks like to me on the map. But um, I don't know why the confusion there. But uh, very varied soils. Out of the satellites, this is probably the the most diverse in soils. But we're still talking, you know, clay and limestone. Um, the plat the vineyards are really along the south facing plateaus and the valleys. Uh, word here is diversity. Yes. Yeah, so you have kind of three areas, the clay limestone slopes uh, in the southeastern part, and then you have a plateau that's all sandy, and then you have um, 
the clay and silt soil at the foot of the slope. So obviously it depends on where you're going, um, but very elegant wines here in Lussac. Puisseguin, this is the highest elevation and mostly Merlot. They're all mostly Merlot, but this is the highest percentage of Merlot planted. Um, and it has very strict laws too, as, as to what you can do. Um, and what you can plant and, and, and yields and all that. Uh, it's interesting, it's, it's a lot more strict in the surrounding areas. It's a very pretty picture here. And then Saint Georges Saint Emilion. This has the most homogeneous terroir of all of the satellites and, and even more so than Saint Emilion as a whole. It's a small area, so it's not hard to be homogeneous, but um, we're talking, um, you know, the limestone bedrock. So you have the the clay and, and, and gravel soils mixed and then underneath uh, the limestone bedrock. And limestone, as you know, is, the, is very spongy. So it, it can retain water when you need it or it drains and holds on to it. So it's really, I mean, everyone loves limestone for wine because it has that great um, hydric, hy, hydro, hydrolysis? No, hydric relations, soil water relations. Um, the wines here from St. Georges are, tend to be very high quality. So really good value if you're looking for an alternative to saint Emilion, which is not that expensive in itself, but um, you, these satellites in general, uh, especially when we get to Pomerol, the Lone de Pomerol, uh, can be a source of really, really good value because they're just not as highly marketed, as highly uh, esteemed. And um, so sad for them, but good for us. Yeah, anytime you don't have the ability to put Grand Cru next to your name, which when we talk about that appellation system is massively confusing in Centimillon as far as the consumer is concerned. Um, and these, at least, these are going to fall in the background, but I agree. That's a, that's a great thing. So, you know, retail options that are every, almost everyday drinking wines for some people, they would be everyday drinking wines or great wines when you're looking at by the glass programs and restaurants these satellite appellations give you that, that opportunity to uh, show somebody high quality Bordeaux um, at a very reasonable price tag. Yeah, so the Grand Cru part is, is where we get confused uh, here. So uh, there's a Saint-Emilion appellation and there's a Saint-Emilion Grand Cru appellation. They're the same geographical area. Um, the only difference is and Grand Cru makes it sound like it's a superior wine, right? It sounds like it's a, a better wine or that it's classified. It is not. Uh, it is just, there's a separate, some separate regulations. It must be 0.5% alcohol, additional alcohol, and has a longer aging requirement than regular saint Emilion. So with minimal effort, I don't want to, you know, criticize, but with minimal effort, you can put Grand Cru in your label. Um, and then there's the classification system, so which is Grand Cru, Grand Cru Classé, and we'll talk about that when we get to it, but it's very confusing. So if you see saint uh, Emilion Grand Cru, doesn't necessarily mean it's been classed as a great growth. It could just be from that appellation. So it's sort of like, I think of it sort of like in Italy when you have the Superiore designation, it's just a little bit more alcohol. It's, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean a superior wine. Um, well, you know, you go back in history and superior wine meant it was a little riper at harvest. <laughs> yeah, good point. So yeah. they came up with it with they came up with it before global warming made everything capable of being Grand Cru. <laughs> right. So yes, I guess at one time perhaps uh, that it was a little bit better. Uh, Pomerol and Lalande de Pomerol, a much smaller area as we'll see in one second. Uh, I want to get to the the next slide. Uh, Oop, there we go, a little sign. Uh, next slide has the map. Um, so this is one of the most important sites for Merlot, probably as, as my friend Nick Jackson says, ground zero for uh, you know Merlot, great Merlot. Um, the, the really top wines here are just so just voluptuous, silky, velvety, elegant wines, um, and you pay for them too. Uh, Pomerol, uh, not as historic, as I said, as St. Emilio. You had the medieval town that it popped up, but Pomerol is really just vineyards. You drive through, and it's just vineyards and vineyards and vineyards. It's like one church, I believe. Um, and when I was over there, we were just driving along, and the bus pulled over. And I said, does anyone want to see Chateau Petrus? It was right there. We are just driving right by Chateau Petrus. I'm like, huh, there it is. 
Um, and I believe you can see Route de Saint-Jacques de Compostelle. So that's that, um, that pilgrimage route that we were talking about, or one of them. So <laughs> speaking of Petrus, famous for blue clay. Um, lots of clay soils here in Pomerol. Uh, not just clay soils, but lots of correct clay soils. You have uh, gravel, you have some light sandy soils, but when we talk about uh, Pomerol in general, the two things that come up over and over are the clay and crosse de fer, which is that iron rich soil that some claim is the secret to Pomerol's greatness. Um, but being that it's not everywhere, uh, I'm not sure if that's fair. Yeah, maybe. But, you know, iron rich soil has a very interesting effect in the vineyard. Um, most most of the minerals that we think of that are, exist in the ground, when you put them in a vineyard, the plant doesn't really have a way to absorb them. But weirdly, um, vines can absorb the iron from the soil and they love it. It's like candy. So they soak it up completely. Um, so that iron makeup is going to be part of the juice going into fermentation. And, you know, an iron rich must going into fermentation, what does iron absolutely love as a, as a reagent in chemistry? It loves oxygen, right? So all that iron is going to be looking to absorb oxygen and uh, create oxides as quickly as it can. And, and it's a very different sort of chemistry and I don't presume to understand it, but having a nascent explanation from someone who understands it fully is you're going to get wines of a very different character when you have iron in the soil um, than you would with the exact same grape and all the other same factors. Uh, you take the iron out, you have a different fermentation um, mix and therefore a very different end product. And I think what they're trying to say about the iron rich soils in Pomerol is that hedonistic nature of Merlot from, from Pomerol at its very best might indeed be a byproduct of the interaction of the iron and oxygen and softening these wines and making them really lush. Yeah, I, I there's, it's a whole rabbit hole you can go down uh, as far as uh, tasting minerals and wine. Uh, but I really do, you know, I can, I can tell, you know, when you have those Terra Rosa wines or the iron rich soils, it really stands out in the wine. You get it almost like a, almost like a tang underneath everything. Yeah. To me, it tastes like you bit your lip. And yeah. Blood in your mouth. <laughs> yep. You know, I actually have lived in a few houses along the way, having moved a bit, um, where there was iron in the water supply, you know, and you get the red stains in the toilet and everything else. And um, you can taste the iron in the water. It tastes like rust, for mm -hmm. lack of a better description, you know, and um, that's, that's a really neat uh, thing to pick up. And some people don't like it and some people do, but it's definitely, definitely findable as a flavor profile. So there's our little map. Um, no great infographics here from Pomerol. Unfortunately, they need to talk to saint Emilion, get their webmaster. Um, but this shows the size of it. It's tiny um, in relation to saint Emilion, in relation to most uh, appellations in Bordeaux. It's, it's not a large appellation. Um, I think La Lande de Pomerol, the only satellite here, it's just two communes, but the soils are very similar to Pomerol. Um, clay, gravel, and you have that cross de fer. 75% Merlot. If you can find a Lalonde de Pomerol wine, snap it up because they tend to be amazing at a third of the price of, uh, oops, of um, your, your Pomerol wines. Um, yeah, back to the website issue. When, when you are a region that sells everything you make at whatever price you ask who cares what your website looks like right? <laughs> you don't need Market, to, uh, marketing is no longer necessary for you don't Pomerol. need to market yourself yeah the, um, the appellation is closed it's about this big every square inch is planted and, and owned by somebody there's there's not really any place to go <laughs> but but just keep selling so i don't remember uh seeing the satellite wines when i was uh on the other side of things and not, not selling it, but buying it. Um, nobody, I never heard of satellites. I'd never heard of the St. Georges or Montagne, Lussac, Puisigan or Lalonde. Um, 
and I wasn't studying for master sommelier, so I didn't have to study those things, but I'm seeing them a lot more now. They're, they're, they're being important to the U.S. Uh, they're not that hard to find anymore. And I think it's, um, you know, as we've been talking about throughout this webinar series, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats and these smaller appellations that maybe didn't have the means to market uh, not too long ago are now, uh, are now available. And um, like I said, in general, really good value, but especially La Lone de Pomerol, there's really almost, um, there's very few differences in the terroirs between Pomerol, La Lone de Pomerol. So yeah, these, you, usually. These wines were there, you know, as I was a buyer by 1996. And in 1996 through eight, there was a few, and this was in Detroit, Michigan suburbs. So not exactly in one New York city for what you could find. Right. But um, their Bordeaux was well loved in uh, Michigan. And so there were a few of the more niche importers were represented in the area and they always had these satellites around and, you know, I think the first time I looked at a bottle of Lalande de Pomerol to buy for the restaurant, it might have been six fifty, or something like that. It was all of the, all of them were under a hundred dollars a case, and um, they became my glassport program go tos for French Bordeaux because I could sell it at a reasonable cost to the consumer as well and stand behind it. No, they're not that price anymore, um, <laughs> nor should they be. Um, but yeah, they they were there but uh, they didn't get a lot of attention necessarily because you didn't have to, to your point, right? right. You could still buy Saint-Emilion Grand Cru and sell it for $10 a glass in 1996 and, and, um, and, and feel good about it, but uh, not anymore. Well, you were talking about marketing yourself as a region and that leads very nicely into the next topic, which is the garagiste. So, uh, the uh, one on the left, the chateau on your left is the uh, Le Pain, Chateau Le Pain. Uh, we also have Valendro and uh, La Mondrotte. Um, these were the, the garagiste movement. And it started because literally, I think it was Valendro um, in Saint Emilion was made in a garage. Um, but these wines that became famous for basically from Robert Parker, and they, they, Oh, they weren't all made in, in garages, but they were made in very tiny quantities um, from very small vineyards. And uh, they were uh, lavishly oaked. They are um, hand-picked, hand-sorted. You know, the, the level of quality was, was directly related to the size. You know, you couldn't do this on a grand scale. So you had these, just making a few barrels of amazing, amazing wine and getting huge reviews from Robert Parker. And then, you know, the rest is history, but it's a little bit of a, it's, it's not exactly uh, fair to the other chateaus who are making, you know, they maybe spill more wine than these, these places are making. Um, you know, if you can afford to do that and you can afford to throw away a lot of your grapes, the yields here for these uh, garage yeast wines are, tremendously low much lower than the surrounding area um, surrounding chateau um and if you can do that and you can get paid for it and you can get the money that's great but it's i w i don't not sure it's fair to call them the best wines of the region um because they're sort of their own category and um it started that it started a sort of a movement of micro chateau that has since sort of um i think died down i don't hear have you heard much talk about that kind of movement in the last few years no, and, and I think in a lot of ways, all the land got bought up to a certain degree. There's not really a lot of room for it. And if you're going to do a micro project now, it's going to go back to what we were talking about in our last episode, where you're buying property out in the coat somewhere because it's available and affordable and you're, or at least reasonably affordable. And you're starting from that and saying, okay, I'm going to take my winemaking experience because you're a famous winemaker at some other well-known chateau and you're going to apply it to a more humble region perhaps is Le Pen still the most expensive I haven't really looked that close lately to see if it was still the highest price coming out of Bordeaux but you know for about a decade and a half it was definitely the highest price wine going um, and you know maybe it's not fair to consider these wines the best of the region and certainly we should never take one critic's opinion uh, or one critic's score as gospel for what 
is quality because those are very different things. Um, but they most certainly paved the way for everybody in the region to raise prices yep. a lot. So they should all be very grateful to the garagiste for the cars they drive and the houses they maintain and the trips they take when COVID's over because their economy was completely altered by these people as well at just the same way that Piedmont was completely altered by Gaia. You know, you, it doesn't matter what you think about his wines or his philosophy or anything else. These people, just like he did, they made a bold step and it helped everybody. Yeah, that's absolutely true. The, the, I believe it was Ballandreau that Parker, he, the 1995 vintage, he rated it higher than Chateau Petrus. Everybody knew Petrus. And they said, who, who is this? You know, who's Ballandreau? And um, Le Pen had already been established uh, and Mond Mondrot. Um, but they, they started popping up. And, and absolutely, it's fair to say that they elevated what the region is thought of. Um, but are they the you know, when you can do sort of like, you know, some of the California cult wines, when you can, you know, you're only producing a couple hundred cases, you can be very, and you can sell them for astronomical prices. You can be very, very um, labor intensive about what you do that, that most wineries, estates, chateau um, cannot. So um, it's, I sort of think of these micro chateau, like I said, as its own separate niche, niche uh, in the region, but um, but they're still cool. And it was very cool to drive. We didn't drive past Le Pen, but you could see it in the distance. I was, I was a little bit um, starstruck when I saw it. So <laughs> if you want to go down the uh, road of websites, here's some websites that you can go on. So as I said, saint Emilion covers everything except for Montagna. And um, Pomerol covers Pomerol, Lalonde Pomerol covers Lalonde Pomerol. Not, not awesome websites, but uh, as always, you can go to uh, the Bordeaux.com, uh, which is where the source of all the, all the uh, really good information. We'll tell you all about it. And we have some, um, we import uh, at Winebo, we import some wines from saint Emilion and Pomerol. And if you want to discover more about them, you can go always go to Winebo.com. And you can sort by country, you can sort by further sort by region, and you can see all the uh, great offerings that we have. We have some really, really cool wines. Oh, are you on mute, Ron? I am. Sorry about that. Uh, no it's problem. Because there's background noise in the house, you know, <laughs> other people who live here, you know, how dare they? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, Croix Canon is one to look up. Um, yes. Wines are really great. They retail about $87.99, depending on what market you're in. And, um, and Chateau La Plagnotte Bellevue is also out there and available. And it's a saint Emilion Grand Cru. And it's really delicious and, and really reasonable. I mean, this is a weekend wine. It's like 40 bucks a bottle. So uh, you and a couple of friends can always afford that and um, easily access. Those are just two. And you can find the rest on our website. And now I want to talk about why we're not covering Francec and Ken and Francec until next time. So it sounds a little crazy. You get the two biggest appellations on, on the right bank, Pomerol and saint Emilion, and Francec and Ken and Francec, maybe not as important. Um, so why is it getting its, why are they getting their own episode? Because they are important to people like my friend, Sally Evans, who is the owner of Chateau Jorset in Francec. And I met her. Uh, she was also becoming an accredited Bordeaux educator at the same time as myself. And we bonded. And uh, I didn't get to go to her, her chateau, but she is um, an expat from England who decided to live the Bordeaux life. And she's um, really cool. So she's going to be with us the next time and tell us about what makes Fronsac and Kenneth Fronsac special what we should know, why we shouldn't underestimate them, um, why we should discover more about them, and then also a little bit about what it's like to, to run a winery in Bordeaux and live that life. It's really cool. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, so please revisit us and have your questions for Sally. I believe her website, if you want to check it out, is chateaugeorge7.com. I should have put that on the, uh, on the website slide, but I didn't want to ruin the surprise. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. That would have ruined the supplies. That's really cool. I'm I'm so happy to, about that. This is gonna be great. Um, just like the when we had the 
the uh, writers on with us who talked about their experiences in, in Lyon, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's going to be great. Um, and I'm glad you arranged that. So just remember every other Tuesday. Uh, so this will be two weeks from today. We'll have that awesome episode. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance and your continued attendance. You can always find all the other episodes on Winebow YouTube channel. Look for the playlist called Imagine This, The Bordeaux Show. Thank you, TJ. Appreciate you doing the research and and guiding the ship for us. And uh, we'll see everybody next time.